In 1978, five young men from Yuba County, California, each suffering from a different intellectual disability or psychiatric condition, drove off to attend a college basketball game. None was ever seen alive again. To this day, no one knows if the men were victims of foul play or simply got lost in the wilderness and succumbed to the elements. Welcome to Macabre Storytime, where I tell my friends some of the weirdest, most brutal, spine-tingliest cases they've never heard of. How's it going? Good. Long time no see. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> anything new and fun in your world before we get going? Oh, we should probably say who we are. I'm uh, Sarah. Uh, I'm Rhonda. There we go. Now, Rhonda, is there anything fun going on in your world? No? Nothing? Cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you asked because I would like to give another little plug to our sister podcast, Malice Aforethought. Sounds boring. Rude. Um, <laughs> so it is, I guess it's, I said this before, it's like our half sister because it's just me doing it. It's my solo pod. It and is. Not as funny as mine. Right. Uh, well, it's not really supposed to be, but whatever. Uh, anyways, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm just naturally funny. So there's that. But anyways, uh, so this pod it's a little bit different it is true crime but this one first of all it has seasons as opposed to just weekly forever episodes and each season deep dives into one case so for example season one which is out right now uh, anywhere you get your podcasts it is on the butcher baker of alaska robert trashbag hansen uh and i call him that because he's a piece of shit uh listen to it you'll find out why and uh, <laughs> so season one has nine episodes about uh, why we hate Robert Hansen. And that is out uh, anywhere you get your podcast now. So go listen to our sister podcast. And the name again? Malice Aforethought. Okie dokie. Go out there and listen. And Download listen. it. Rate, listen review, et cetera, et cetera. It. All of that. Yeah. Um, okay, are you ready to just get right into it today? Let's do it. Let's do it. Our story today revolves around five friends from Yuba County, California, which is just north of Sacramento. The five friends are Gary Mathias, Bill Sterling, Jack Hewitt, Ted, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher his last name, Weir. Weir? It's W-E-I-H-E-R. Sounds right. Weir? Wire? What? Wire? Eh, I don't know. I'm going to say weir. <laughs> and Jack Madruga. So there's two Jacks. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about who they were. Now, before I get into uh, each one specifically, I will uh, preface this by saying that each of the men, uh, each of the men had a different intellectual disability or psychiatric condition. Okay. Okay. Uh, so before, I just wanted to preface with, with that so it uh, you kind of gives a, a fuller picture of who they are as I read this. Okay. Now, Jack Madruga, he was 30 at the time of this incident, which took place in the 70s. We'll get, we'll get there. But um, just think about the fact that it is the late 70s. Okay. Jack Madruga is 30 years old, and he was a dishwasher at Sun Sweet Growers, which is a dried fruit company. And uh, he, at one point, he even helped his friend Bill Sterling, one of the group, get a job there. Now, family members later told investigators after this incident happened that Jack was mentally handicapped. And I, they did not use the word handicapped because, again, this was the 70s. But I do not like the R word, so I'm not going to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but just know that if you, right, if you look up any... Um, uh, like newspaper articles, uh, they do use it, and and not like in a mean way, just that that's the word they that's used the at the time. <laughs> so, uh, just just be prepared for that. But uh, we're we're not going to use that word. So basically, they said that he was not men mentally handicapped in the quote normal sense, but just that he was, and this is a quote, slow in his thought processes. 
So just a little delayed, maybe. Okay. Okay. Uh, he could manage his finances and he could generally take care of himself. But he, along with all the men that we talk about, he did live with his parents. Everyone lived with their parents. Okay. Now, Jack had what was classified as an uh, unremarkable tenure of service with the Army. He was a truck driver from 1966 to 1968 uh, before he was discharged. And as such, he was only one of two men in this group of five that had a driver's license, knew how to drive. Okay. Okay. Next, we come to Ted Weir. And I'm very sorry to his family if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, He was 32 at the time. He loved making new friends. But according to his brother, Dallas, He lacked common sense, which that's literally everybody. But uh, (laughs) this is a little bit different. Uh, His parents later told investigators that he would question instructions as simple as stopping at a stop sign. Like even that he was like, well, why do we have to do that? Uh, There was a story about how the Weir home once caught fire and Ted, he insisted on staying in bed and because he needed to sleep because he had to go to work the next day. His brother had to drag him from the burning home because Ted wouldn't leave. It's Why like he, leave? Well, it's like he didn't understand the connection between the, f- the fire house, and like the I, on fire and I need to leave. Burned. Right. As opposed to, but I have to work tomorrow, which means I need to sleep which means I need to stay in the bed so that I can sleep for work tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, so this is how they described him. Not directly correlated to it, but it reminds me of that video you sent me the other day where the lady's like, you don't need a driver's license to drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> you don't? I, I assure you, ma'am, you do. <laughs> um, Who do you think you are? The police? <laughs> yes? Yes. Oh, well, you're wrong. Because <laughs> She's like, I know my rights. And they're like, well, you don't. You do not. <laughs> You do not. You are wrong. You are wrong. <laughs> Anyways. Um, <laughs> you do not know your rights. You are very, very wrong. Uh, anyways. Uh, back to this. Um, so next. Sorry, sidetrack. Next we have Bill Sterling, who was 29 at the time. Now, he left his parents home on that fateful night with his $15 weekly allowance. And he had maps of California, Sacramento, Stockton, and San Francisco. Super cute that he took maps with him because obviously uh, we did not have GPS and cell phones at the time. No, we did not. Um, Now, he at one point, uh, he worked at Beale Air Force Base as a dishwasher in the early 70s. But his mom made him quit because she found out that the airmen on base would routinely get him drunk so they could steal his money. Well, I guess that's a good good reason. Yeah. I, I can see that. Uh, <laughs> now, on, buddy. Yeah, just, uh, Have some drinks just a with little, us. Little, little drinky poo with us. Uh, now, the Sterling family, they had a cabin near Bucks Lake in Plumas National Forest, which is in Northern California. Uh, but one fishing trip as a teenager was enough for Bill to know, not a fan. Did not like it. Did not participate in future fishing trips. And this is pertinent. That's why I'm telling you. But just put a little wee pin in it. Stick it on the board behind you. We're going to circle back and you'll realize why I'm telling you that. I Now, next we come to the other Jack, Jack Hewitt. He was 24 at the time. And he was the most severely handicapped of the group. He could not read, write, or dial a telephone. Did not like talking on the telephone. Like his other people had to make phone calls and speak for him. He did not like it. He depended highly on his mother and Ted Weir, one of the friends, whom he'd known for about eight years at this point. So since he was a teenager. Uh, Now, Jack was shy. He had a speech impediment and he did not like being away from home for long periods of time and certainly not overnight. Well, that explains why he didn't like speaking on the phone because he had a speech impediment. Right. Yeah. Plus, he can't dial it. Yes. So, yeah, he's just shy and nervous about it, I'm sure. Now, at one point after the incident occurred, then Yuba County Lieutenant uh, Ayers, who was their cases, the case that we're about to get into, he was the lead investigator at the time. He commented that some members of the group had IQs as low as the 40s. 
And this comment was most likely in reference to Jack Hewitt. Okay. Okay. And then finally, we come to Gary Mathias, who was 25 at the time of the incident. Now, Gary's story is a little bit different because he did not have uh, like a learning disability, anything like that. He's the member of the group that had a psychiatric condition. Okay. Now, Gary was a native of, U of Yuba County, California. And in the 70s, in the early 70s, he was in the army and he was stationed in West Germany. And at the time, he developed a severe drug problem while he was in the military. Okay. Now, eventually, he wound up being diagnosed as a schizophrenic and was given a psychiatric discharge from the military. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he returned home to California to live with his parents and to begin treatment at a local mental hospital. Now, initially, initially, <laughs> now, initially, he had a rough time adjusting to life back at home, uh, and he found himself getting into trouble quite often. Um, he he was almost arrested twice for assault, and he was he often experienced psychotic episodes that landed him in the local VA hospital. So he had a lot of trouble at first, but. By 1978, when our story takes place, he had turned it around and he was being treated on an outpatient basis. Okay. So he was... He was doing, doing well. Better. Right. Now, he was considered by his doctors to be, quote, a sterling success case. So he was doing everything he needed to do. He wasn't causing trouble anymore. Wasn't... Like, all the assaults and all of that, that was directly related to, like, not managing his disease... Now that he's managing it, he's taking his medicine, doing his therapies and everything, he's doing well. He's doing what he needs to do. Great. He turned it around. That's great. End of story. We're done. Happy time. Yay. Yay. Happy story today. Just kidding. Now, <laughs> all of the men's parents collectively referred to the group as the boys. Very cute. Mm, adorable. Uh, and their favorite activity with sports, especially basketball, and they played on a team together called the Gateway Gators, which was supported by a local program for people with mental disabilities. Now, this brings us to the date of the incident. The date. On February 25th, 1978, the Gators were due to play their first game in a week-long tournament sponsored by the Special Olympics. Big deal. Yes. The winners of this tournament would win a free week in Los Angeles. Free trip. All five men prepared for the big game the night before. They were going so far as to lay out their uniforms, make sure their parents knew like when to wake them up so they would not oversleep. They'd be on time for the game. Very excited about it. Now, the night before the game, so February 24th, They've got all their stuff ready. They're they're good. They're set for the morning. They decide they're going to drive to Chico, California, uh, and they're going to watch their favorite college team, UC the UC Davis basketball team, uh, play against Chico State at the Chico State campus. Okay. So Jack Madruga, one of the two with a driver's license, he drove the group about fifty miles north. To the Chico State campus in his turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego. After their team won, UC Davis won the game. The boys, they got back in Madruga's car and they drove a short distance to Bears Market in downtown Chico, where they got some snacks, some sodas, and some cartons of milk. Very wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, it was just before 10 o'clock which was closing time at the market. So the clerk remembered the group because she was annoyed that this large group came in so close to closing time, kind of put her off of her like closing routine. Right. Right. So she remembered them specifically. So we know that they stopped there. Some of their parents, they stayed up late waiting for their sons to come home. Cause remember they're delayed. They're mm -hmm. a little bit different. They're very, I'm sure they're very protective of their sons. I'm sure. So they stayed up wait, stayed up late, stayed up late waiting. Uh, when none had returned home by the next morning, 
The police were notified and they reported all five men missing. So the investigation. (laughs) Now, police in Yuba, both Yuba County and Butte County, which is the next county over from Yuba County, they began searching along the route the men took to Chico the day before, like between where they lived in Yuba City and Chico. Now, police found no sign of the men or the car on this route, but a Plumas National Forest ranger contacted authorities a few days later to report that he had seen the missing Mercury Montego parked along Oroville Quincy Road in the Plumas National Forest on February 25th. The next day. Right. This was the day after they went missing. Mm Mm-hmm. Initially, the ranger didn't really think too much about seeing this car because a lot of people would drive through the area on weekends for ski trips. Mm -hmm. Uh, But after he saw the missing person's bulletin, he knew that this was a vital clue in the investigation. So he contacted authorities. So the authorities go. The car is there. Evidence inside the car, like uh, empty wrappers for those snacks they bought. Uh, empty soda cans and milk cartons. Uh, those were all in the car from that they purchased in that market in Chico. Mm-hmm. Along with programs for the basketball game that they had been at and a California roadmap. So this suggested that the, these five men were in this car between the time they were last seen at this convenience store and the time that the car was abandoned here. Right. Okay. So that's literally all we know. Because finding this car, it only led to more questions. First question is the location of the car. Uh, I don't know what you know about uh, Northern California geography. That much. Uh, But um, Yuba County's here. Plumas National Forest is here. (laughs) Chico's up here. How did they get over here? So basically, uh, they're going to go... Not due north, but pretty north to get from Yuba County to Chico. Uh, Like like I said, they're just kind of shoot north. Uh, Plumas National Forest is to the east. Like, how the hell did they get over there? Mm -hmm. Like, why is the car there? Like, we know how they got there. They got there in the car. But why? Right. Um, When they were supposed to be going back home. They were supposed to be, exactly, supposed to be going just south back home. How the hell are they way over here in Plumas National Forest? So... The car, it was found 70 miles, so further than even the distance between home and the university that they went to. It was further away than that because that was 50 miles. This is 70 miles. In the opposite direction. It was 70 miles away from Chico, and it was far from any direct route between Chico and Yuba City or any of the men's like individual homes. It was a completely different direction. None of the men's families could speculate as to why they might have driven up this long, winding dirt road on a winter night into a high elevation, remote forest without any extra clothing the night before this big basketball game that they had all been looking forward to for weeks. There was literally no reason for them to be there. Right. So we already know that Bill Sterling did not like spending time out in that area because that's his family had the cabin out in Plumas National Forest. Mm -hmm. And Jack Madruga's parents said that he did not like cold weather and he'd never even been up into the mountains. Now, Ted Weir's mom would later tell reporters her son would not have missed that basketball game for anything. So there's no reason for them to just be like on a little jaunt into the mountains Mm -hmm. when this basketball game's coming up. He would not have missed it At all. She said that he had been to the Special Olympics playoffs the year before, and he had gotten none other than Sally Struthers' autograph. (laughs) Big dealio at the time. Right. For those of you who don't know, she was a mom of the family. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, So this was a huge deal to all of them. And he especially knew it was a huge deal because he'd been there before. And they were hoping to see Sally Struthers again because she was a big proponent of, Mm. like, Special Olympics and whatnot. Right. Uh, So they were hoping to to meet her, the others that had not met her the year before. Uh, Now, furthermore, it could not be determined why the men abandoned the car. They reached about 4,400 feet in elevation 
up the mountain, which at this time of year was about where the snow line was. And it was just short of where the road closed for the winter. Okay. Okay. Uh, Now, the car did become stuck in some snow drifts. And there was evidence that the men tried to, like, spin the wheels to get out of it. But the police noted that the snow wasn't deep enough that five physically healthy young men couldn't have been able to just push it out. Okay. Uh, So, like... Physically, they would have been capable of getting the car out of the snowdrift. Right. Uh, mentally, I don't know if they would have like necessarily thought about it. Thought about it. See, that's where a lot of questions come in on this case because what were they? A what connections were they able to make with things because they were they were delayed. Yeah, but you know, two of them were in the military. Mm-hmm. One was o- like okay, mind wise, but he, he was schizophrenic. schizophrenic. But he was medicated. Yes. Well, that can affect your thinking, but right. But um, you know, one of the five would have thought, "Hey, you know, let's you'd, try and you'd push think, the car." Yeah, out. you would think that. But that's where a lot of questions come in. Is like what I know as who I am. I would think this, but like, but I don't have developmental delays Mm -hmm. you know so i don't know what they necessarily would have thought of right um you can guess but you don't know right so the keys were missing which suggested to police that the car might not have been functioning properly but when authorities later hotwired the car the engine started immediately and the fuel gauge indicated that the car had about a quarter tank of gas so it wasn't out of gas and it was working fine. It was not out of gas. It was not dead. So why did they leave the car? Those, yeah. Like I said, finding this car did not answer a single question other than where did the car go? Where did the people go? It didn't even answer that because they're not in the car. This mystery only deepened once the car was towed to the police garage for a more thorough forensic exam. Now, the undercarriage of the car had no dents, gouges, mud scrapes, or even a low-hanging muffler, despite being driven a long way up a winding, bumpy mountain road in the dead of night. So police surmised that the car was either driven by someone who knew the road or someone who was being extremely careful. Now, Jack Madruga definitely was not familiar with the area. Right. Uh, and his family was adamant that he would never have let someone else drive his car. So he's being extremely careful. So he's the driver. But why? We still don't know why. Right. Also, the car was left unlocked. And one of the windows was rolled down. And his family insisted that it was not like him at all to leave his car unsecured like that. Hmm. Yeah. And also, it's February. Uh, Northern California. We're not talking about Los Angeles here. It's a little chilly. It's a little cold. Why is your, like why is the window down? Mm-hmm. Uh, now the next obvious step would be to search the area for the missing men, right? Right. Uh, but these efforts uh, they were quickly hampered by a severe snowstorm. Two days later, uh, some of the searchers themselves nearly became lost. Uh, so further search efforts were called off due to the continuing bad weather. So the, only two days into the search. Well, I guess you don't want to lose more people. Exactly. For people. <laughs> oh, I don't blame them at all for calling off the search. It's, right. I just knowing the timeline. Just wish it had gone differently. Right. <laughs> like we're we're going to get there and you're going to be like, oh, God. To, oh, they were just right there. <laughs> um, now, as a result of the disappearances, there was intense local media coverage on this case, as you can imagine. Naturally, uh, police received several reports of sightings of the men after they left Chico, including reports of them both elsewhere in California and elsewhere just in the country. Uh, we know how helpful tip lines are or like right. how 
I mean, they can be helpful, but we know how uh, obnoxious it can be to just get a buttload of ridiculous tips that you know are bullshit. Uh, but two of these alleged sightings did stand out to police. The first sighting that stood out was a man named Joseph Shans. I'm hoping that's correct. I'm terrified of like mispronouncing pronouncing people's names. <laughs> um, of <laughs> Sacramento, come back at you. It's pronounced this. <laughs> Sorry, I just I like to be um I like to mispronounce my name. Well, that's just fun. Uh, I like to be uh, considerate. Anyways, uh, so he was from Sacramento, and he told police that he inadvertently wound up spending the night of the 24th through the 25th on the road near where the group's car was found. So he had driven up uh, to, like, near where he had a cabin because he was just checking on some things before uh, a weekend ski trip with the family. At about 5.30 p.m. on the 24th, about 150 feet up the road from where the Mercury Montego was found, Sean's himself got stuck in the snow. Now, in the process of trying to free his vehicle, he realized he was beginning to experience early symptoms of a heart attack. Hmm. So he decided to go back into his car and keep the engine running to keep himself warm because he's having a heart attack. Now, six hours later, and in severe pain from this heart attack, uh, he sees headlights approach from behind him, like a little bit way, little ways down the road, but he can see them. Okay. He looks out of his vehicle, and he saw a car parked a bit behind him with the headlights on and a group of people around it, one of which he says appeared to be a woman holding a baby. Now, he called out for help, but instead of helping, the group just kind of, like, stopped talking and turned off the headlights. Just like, oh, no, sir, don't see me. They're just going to – just everyone be quiet. He won't, he won't see us if we turn off the headlights. Um, <laughs> now, sometime later, Sean saw a second vehicle pull up that he believed to be a truck, like a pickup truck. And saw more lights. This time it was flashlights. But again, when he called out for help, the people just turned the the lights off. And, like, didn't, like, acknowledge him at all or help him or anything. Who wants to help a random person right. calling for help? Now, after his car ran out of gas early the next morning, Sean's, his pain, I don't like calling him Sean's because I don't think that, I don't know if that's right. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, his pain had subsided enough. For him to walk the eight miles back down the mountain road to a lodge nearby where the manager drove him home. On the way, why he drove him home and not to the hospital, I don't know. But on the way, they passed the Mercury Montego. At the point where this man said he recalled hearing voices and like seeing a car with headlights behind his car. They passed this Mercury now, Sean's himself is unsure whether or not he actually saw the second car uh, because and even and even if he did, if it was a truck, because he himself admits that he was somewhat delirious from the pain that he was in from this heart attack. Right. Uh, doctors and the doctors did confirm that he did indeed experience a mild heart attack. So he did have a heart attack in this instance. Now, as for the idea that these men would have just ignored someone calling out for help, Ted Weir's mother said that that was not like her son at all. And she recalled a story of how he and Bill Sterling had helped someone get to a hospital after overdosing on Valium. So they're known to be helpful people and wouldn't have just ignored this person repeatedly calling out to them for help. Right. If they were alone. They could, you know, they weren't with a mother, with a lady with a baby. But again, mm -hmm. like, could he have been hallucinating or could he have just, like, misseen something? It's possible. Because remember, I mean, the, the the truck, it's not, like, next to him. It's No, it's back. Like, okay. 150 feet back from him. It's not, like, super clear. And it's dark. It's nighttime. Right. And you're uh, having a heart attack. Right. So there's that. Uh, so I, I don't know, like... 
the whole seeing a woman and a baby thing? Like, could he have just been like, you know how your mind just like sees something and it makes it into a shape that you recognize? You know what I mean? Yeah. I can't think of what that's called, but um, like maybe he was just like, uh, yeah, I think that's a woman and her baby, but I am literally dying from a heart attack. <laughs> right. So who knows? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, now, that's the first sighting that the police were like, huh, interesting. The second sighting, the other notable alleged sighting, came from a woman who worked in a store in the town of Brownsville, which was about 30 miles from where the car had been abandoned and which they would have reached had they continued on the road that they were on. Now, on March 3rd, so a couple weeks later, or like a week later, uh, the, this woman, she had seen the flyers with the men's pictures on it and their information and information about the uh, $1,215 reward, very specific amount of money. <laughs> uh, and she contacted deputies and was like, hey, four of these men had stopped at the store that I work at in a red pickup truck two days after they were last seen at the convenience store in Chico. And the store owner corroborated this account. Hmm. Why only four? I don't know. So the woman said she immediately realized that the men weren't from the area, quote, because of their big eyes and faces. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Descriptive. <laughs> sure. That's uh, like, are you implying something about their mental fortitude in that? Or are you just being like, I could tell they weren't from around these parts. <laughs> Like one of those things, like I've never seen you here, so you must not be from here, or, right. you know, like what their big eyes and faces. What the, what does that even mean? Um, so she said that two of the men who she identified as Bill Sterling and Jack Hewitt were in the telephone booth outside the store and the other two men went inside. The police considered this woman a credible witness and they took this account seriously. I do not see why. <laughs> uh, now, the store owner identified Ted Weir and Jack Hewitt as two men who came into the store to buy burritos, chocolate milk, gross, together, delicious, separate, gross, together. I was going to say, why are you grossing chocolate milk? And so does. No, burritos and chocolate milk together? No, thank you. I was just, just going to say, why you, Why were you grossing chocolate milk? I That's didn't what I know said. it was a combo. Yeah. Chocolate milk and burritos together? Not good. Recipe for disaster. Burritos alone, delicious. Chocolate milk alone, delicious. Not together. Never the tween shall meet. Uh, anyways, uh, so they bought the burritos, chocolate milk, and some sodas. Ted's brother later told the Los Angeles Times that driving to another town in someone else's car and completely ignoring their basketball game was uh, completely out of character for his brother and the group as a whole. Uh, but staying close to Jack Hewitt was definitely in line with Ted's normal behavior, as the two often stuck together more than with the others. Uh, but I don't buy it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think this had anything to do with them. And they just saw a reward poster with a reward list in it and were like, hmm, yeah, they were, uh, they were here. Why are you stalking the phone booth outside? <laughs> <laughs> We'll split the twelve hundred fifteen dollars. We'll, we'll, we'll each get uh, six hundred and seven dollars and fifty cents. Uh, Score. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, the first first one, yes, because they when they drove by they saw the car and the car is where they said they saw it. Okay, second one, no, I don't, I don't buy that at all. Uh, you? No. Okay. <laughs> Any any anything you want to add to that? I just want to know why they're shocking the phone booth. <laughs> they're just like watching it. You you watch everybody that goes in your phone booth. If they're not from around these parts, and their big heads and faces, <laughs> or big, big eyes. eyes and faces. Sorry. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, now, <laughs> we're horrible people. They're more horrible than we horrible. are. Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> because they're trying to claim a reward. Yeah, because yeah, I saw them. People never do that. Now, in their desperation to find their missing son, Jack Madruga's parents went so far as to consult 
you guessed it, a local psychic on the case. Now, this psychic named Gloria Elizabeth Daniel, very fancy name, uh, she was a member of the metaphysical non-denominational church called the Saudi. <laughs> now, Gloria would not talk to reporters, but her husband, William Daniel, did say that the church, which practiced healing and prophecy, whatever that means, was happy to help and was working with the sheriffs more than the families. Okay. The sheriff's office, however, uh, they were quick to say that they were not dealing with any psychics and were, and this is my favorite part of the whole story, basing their investigation on logic. Love it. Little, <laughs> little twist of the knife to those psychics. <laughs> you mean they weren't following the psychics' advice? They were not. They weren't following. They were, you know, following clues and stuff. Yeah, crazy. Police work. Imagine that. Now, crazy. this brings us to a few months later. It's June 4th, 1978. A little over three months have passed since the five men went missing. And a group of motorcyclists went to a trailer uh, maintained by the U.S. Forest Service at a campsite almost 20 miles from where the Montego had been found. Okay. The front window of the trailer was broken. And when they opened the door... They were met with the unmistakable odor of a decaying body. And it was Ted Weir. Ted's body was found on a bed with eight sheets wrapped around his body and head. The autopsy showed that Ted died from a combination of starvation and hypothermia. I'm just going to uh, – quick sidebar – it takes a while to die of starvation. Yes. <laughs> it's it's not a quick thing. No. So. It's like uh, 30 to 45 days, depend, well, depending on how right. big you are. But um, it, it's not a quick death. No. Um, and isn't he the one that was spotted in the, the yes. shop with yes, his he was. buddy? He was, yes. Yeah. So. Uh, now, his feet were badly frostbitten and almost gangrenous. And he had lost nearly half of his body weight, which initially was about 200 pounds. And the growth of his beard suggested that he was alive as long as 13 weeks after this group went missing. So, yeah, not a very slow death or not a very fast death. No, it was not fast at all. And this is where you start to think, God, if only that two-day search could have extended because they were alive. Mm -hmm. At least he was. He's right there. He's right there. I mean, it was like 30 miles away, but still. Or 20 miles, excuse me. 20 miles into the forest, but still. If the search would have went on. Then, had they know. extended it, they could have found him. Mm -hmm. So, that, yeah, that's where that kind of comes back. And you're like, oh, damn it. On a table next to the bed were some of Ted's personal effects, including his wallet with cash still inside a ring with his name engraved on it, and a necklace that he was known to wear. Also on the table was a gold watch that did not belong to Ted and a partially melted candle. Ted was found wearing a velour shirt and lightweight pants, but his shoes were missing. <laughs> Remember, his feet are frostbitten, swollen with frostbite. Right. His shoes are missing. Now, investigators, they could not understand how Ted came to this fate. No fire had ever been set in the trailer's fireplace. Despite there being an ample supply of matches and paper that could be used as kindling in the trailer. But they never started a fire. Also, uh, the trailer had heavy forestry clothing inside of it, which would have helped keep the men warm during this severe storm. Right. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, a dozen military ration cans were found to have been brought in from an outside storage shed and eaten. But a locker in the very same shed held more dehydrated food that was enough. It would have been enough to feed all five men for a year. So there was plenty of food in this that was, that shed. Was a good place to find. <laughs> yeah. But none of it was touched. Just those 
just that dozen uh, military ration cans. That's all that they took when they had all this food. Hmm. It was in the exact same shed as the cans they did eat, but they didn't touch it. Furthermore, another nearby shed had a butane tank in it with a valve that, had they turned it and opened it, would have fed the trailer's heating system. <laughs> and this is where you think to yourself, but would they have made that connection? Right. I don't know. Like, I don't even know if I would have been, I would have been like, is this going to blow up if I turn this knob? I don't know what this does. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, it also seemed that Ted was not alone in the trailer. Remember, there's a watch in there that's not his, first of all. Right. Investigators suspected that Gary Mathias and possibly Jack Hewitt had also been in the trailer. Now, uh, one of these were a little bit obvious because Gary's shoes were in the trailer. So there was a, it's not like amazing police work to figure that one out. But uh, the thing, but another thing is, aside from his shoes being there, uh, the the rations cans that we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, they were opened with a P38 can opener, which only Gary or Jack Madruga would have been familiar with from their military service. Right. Now, investigators suspected that Gary, his feet also swollen with frostbite, may have decided to leave his shoes behind and put Ted's shoes on. Maybe Ted had bigger feet uh, when he decided to venture back outside. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Now, after finding Ted's body, searchers returned to Plumas National Forest to continue the search for the remaining four men. Because remember, this is June now, so right. we don't have to worry about winter no, no storms. storms. <laughs> yeah. Now, they started by following along the road between where the Montego was found and the trailer. Uh, the next day, June 5th, searchers found remains that were later identified as belonging to Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling on opposite sides of the road about 11 and a half miles from where the car was abandoned. Jack Madruga's body had been partially consumed by scavenging animals. Kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. to, to it's been there a couple months. Right. Uh, and only bones remained of Bill Sterling's body, which were scattered over a small area by wildlife. So how did they know it was him? They uh, took the remains back and tested them. I'm guessing maybe some dental records were involved. Okay. I mean, DNA wasn't like a thing yet. so Right. That's what my question I'm going to go with dental records. Yeah, DNA. Um, <laughs> wasn't. Yeah, they weren't really into that yet. Uh, now... Autopsy showed that both men, how they did autopsies on bones, I do not know. I am not a forensic pathologist. Uh, but autopsies showed that both men died of hypothermia. Deputies surmised that perhaps one of the men gave in to the need to sleep that comes along with becoming hypothermic or like the late stages of being hypothermic and laid down and the other friend or the other, the other man stayed with his friend, later succumbing to hypothermia himself. Makes sense. Yes. It makes sense and is still very sad because... It is very sad. Yeah. Uh, that, ha that means that they, that night died. And mm -hmm. that's what happened on the walk to this trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, now, two days later, on June the 7th, another search party that included Jack Hewitt's father found Jack's jacket under a manzanita bush about two miles northeast of the trailer. They tried to not have his father take part in this search well, party, but he yeah. was like, yeah, no, I'm doing this. Uh, you don't want the father to find the dead son's body. Right. And uh, unfortunately, Jack Hewitt he found this jacket that was his son's, and when he picked up the jacket, his son's spine fell out. Oh. Yeah. Um, poor, poor dad. Yeah. Uh, I really wish he hadn't been the on this search party. <laughs> his shoes and jeans were also nearby, which helped identify the body. And his skull was found about 300 feet away the next day. And dental records later did confirm that this was Jack Hewitt. He, too, died of hypothermia. About a quarter mile northwest of the trailer, 
searchers found three Forest Service blankets and a rusted flashlight by the road. But it was impossible to determine how long they'd been there, who left them there, or if they were connected to these five men in any way. But they could have been maybe, like maybe Gary took them from from the trailer and like they had been abandoned at some point. Maybe, but we don't know. They could have been there for much longer or not as long. You know, who knows? Right. Uh, now, Gary Mathias. Right. Uh, Gary Mathias was nowhere to be found. And he had not taken his medication in months. Remember, he's the one who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. He had to take three pills twice a day, which he had not been since February. So they distributed pictures of him to mental institutions all over California. Because if you have an untreated schizophrenic person just kind of wandering around, they're probably going to wind up in one, right? Right. But the search for Gary Mathias was called off on June 19th. And no trace of him has ever been found. Hmm. Just evaporated, huh? Just is gone. Poof. Right. So some theories. Uh, investigators, they were never able to completely explain the events that led to the deaths of these four men and the disappearance of the fifth. Um, it was hypothesized that the men, they simply took a wrong turn on their way home. Uh, and that put them on this fateful trip up the mountain road. So for some reason, the men decided to abandon their car, which was fully functional, had gas. And instead of heading back down the road in the direction they had come from, where they know there is civilization to be found, they continued up the road in the direction they were heading. Right. And again, this is kind of where you come back to, like, why would they have done that? Were they just, like, single-minded, like, we got to keep moving forward? Or, like, why not go back? Right, but that's trying to get into their heads when yeah they might I, think like we do. Why, why, why not go back? Uh, yeah, it's and that's what people are are asking. Like, why would they not go back where you know what's back there instead of continuing where you don't know? And some of you have never been in the mountains, and some of you don't like the mountains. <laughs> so why continue? Why not mm -hmm. go back? Uh, so like I said, just lots of bigger questions. Uh, to be had here. Um, it's believed that Bill Sterling and Jack Madruga, the two that were found on opposite sides of the road, about 11 miles mm -hmm. from the car on the way to the trailer. Uh, it's believed that they died of hypothermia on the walk up the mountain road uh, before the group reached the trailer. So that's why there's no trace of them. And they don't believe they were ever in the trailer. It was just the other three, just Ted Gary and Jack Hewitt. Yeah, they didn't make it that far. Right. And like we said in the Alyssa Lamb episode, it does not take long to succumb to hypothermia. Because you would think, oh, it's like hasn't been that long. Is it really, you know? Right. But like we talked about then, even at 40 degree, like if you're in Fort Granted, that's water. But still, if you're, it's 40 degrees, you can become in 40 degree water, you can become hypothermic within like 15 minutes. Right. So if it's February and you're in the snow... Right. It's you not going to take that. <laughs> right. Uh, it, can, it can move fast. Because you're in snow, which is making you wet, which is making you cold. And exactly. They're, and depending on the mountains, it's going to be windy. And right. And like, it was, like we said earlier, Ted's feet were frostbitten to shit and almost gangrenous. Mm -hmm. So they definitely weren't uh, dressed for the trek. <laughs> no. Uh, now, the remaining three men then found the trailer. This is what they think. They think the remaining three men found the trailer, broke a window to get in, but were fearing getting in trouble or getting arrested for, like, breaking into this private property trailer. So maybe they were too afraid to, like, use too much. Which, that like, I can see that. But at some point, when does your desire to live overcome that? Right. I mean... Again, we get into the they weren't they don't think like we do because maybe to them getting in trouble is worse than dying. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe they didn't think death was an option really going to happen. Yeah. 
Um, they didn't think that was because it's. I mean, it's just it's just snow mm-hmm. and cold. Like you right. know, big deal. It's not gonna uh, happen to us. We'll just... Yeah, I mean, maybe they just didn't think that was like really gonna happen. Right. But me, I find a trailer loaded with food and heat and blankets and warm clothes, and I'm staying. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna eat the. I'm not gonna die of starvation. I'm gonna eat. I'm hunkering down. We're gonna even if it's here. dehydrated uh, ration food. I'm still gonna eat it because exactly. <laughs> I my my desire to live outweighs my desire to not eat dehydrated ration food. <laughs> right. I will um, eat your gross food, but I will live. <laughs> exactly. It's then believed that after they thought Ted had died, Gary and Jack decided to try and find their way back or to someone who could help, uh, but they split up. And didn't stick together. And that's why Gary was not found with Jack. It could also be just animals carried Gary away, like, fully. And we just, like, I don't know why only one fully and not the others. But who knows. Uh, But obviously Ted was not dead. Because he lived for, like they said, according to, like, the beard growth and how much weight he lost, he had been alive for probably three months. Mm Mm-hmm. He probably died not long before they found him because this was a little over three months later. Yep. Now, which sucks because, you know, exactly. He waited so long. Exactly. He's just sitting there barely, barely holding on. Really, he's just probably just laying there. It's just, it's sad to think about. A slow, agonizing, just, death. yeah, just laying there with your feet like about to fall off and. Just starving, like literally starving, starving to death and freezing. And yeah, it's just probably, you know, dying of thirst too. Yeah. I mean, dying of thirst will kill you faster than starvation. Yeah, I guess they gave him. They mu- he must have had a water source. Something. Yeah. I don't know. That's like the main theory the, of like the way things went down. I will say. And I don't put any stock into this, and I and it really irritates me what I was reading this part, this particular theory, or I don't know if theory is even what I would call it, but uh, the families of the four deceased men think that it's possible that Gary Mathias had something to do with their son's deaths, which I think is bullshit. And I think they just didn't like Gary because it was it was known that they didn't really. Uh, like him as much they didn't really trust him as much because he'd had these problems like uh you know getting arrested and all this stuff uh and and some uh some violence issues when he was not being treated for schizophrenia uh but again that was had a problem with his mental uh, right mental illness but it had been a while he'd been like on the straight and narrow he was doing what he needed to do and i just think they just didn't like gary because he was a different kind of different than their sons right and he was having this problem because he was having problems adjusting to life after the military after the military and and schizophrenia being diagnosed as a schizophrenic right both of those together even one of those can yeah give you you know issues yeah and you have both of them there's going to be issues. I'm so, sorry. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just think it's kind of bullshit that they were like, I think he had something to do with it because they, I guess because he had disappeared. They didn't know where he went. And they just were trying – not that they were trying to pin it on him, but they were like – I mean, I get where they're – Saying maybe he did something. I I'm get like, where they're coming from. You know, all my – you know, my kid's dead and all these other friends are dead, but you're the one that, you know, just But we don't know if he's alive. Right, I know, but I'm sure he's dead too, honestly. Well, he's probably dead too, but you know, we don't have an answer. But like So no answer means, you know, you had something to do with it. You just disappeared. That's the thing. I think they're just trying to point a finger because they didn't like him. Because right. he was he was a different kind of different. Yeah. He was different in the wrong way for them. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. If he were alive, like we said, he was off his medication for over three months at this point when the bodies are found. Mm -hmm. Uh, If he's out there, he's going to be causing trouble because that's what he did before. Mm -hmm. If he's if he's alive and unmedicated, which he isn't because his medication was at home because they weren't supposed to be gone for overnight. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to come back home. If he's out there and unmedicated, he's going to be causing trouble. You will come across him. Yeah. But, you know. But no trace of him was ever found. They just wanted to 
point a finger and blame somebody for the deaths of their kid. Right. And I just think it's because he, he wasn't the right kind of different. Right. And that's why they're kind of all four of them kind of got on, I don't know, kind of pointed the finger in that direction. And and they were talking about how, like, uh, his family didn't participate in, like, interviews or, or whatever things they were doing. And I'm like, okay, first of all, they know you, like, literally did not like their son who has also disappeared. It's not like he's at home with them living it up. Right. He's gone. They also lost a child. And you are acting like that child did something wrong. I wouldn't want to be around you either. Exactly. I wouldn't want to take part in shit with you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I don't blame them at all for not wanting to participate in these things. Also, just like, like we said all the time, people mourn differently. Their child is gone. Maybe they don't want to keep rehashing it in all these interviews and things. Exactly. Maybe they just want to mourn the loss of their child that they privately feel isn't coming back. Yeah. And just mm -hmm. do it alone and not in front of everybody. Yeah, and I don't. Everybody blame wants to do it with the world watching, right? That's so. Yeah, I just think they just didn't like him, and that's why they're. So I don't even consider that a theory that that he did something. I honestly, I think he died up there on that mountain, and I don't know if he fell into something, or uh, like animal an animal took his entire body away. Maybe, like, he wasn't uh, decomposed yet and just, like, grabbed the body and took the whole thing away. I, like, I don't know. But, like, I think he also died up there. They just mm -hmm. couldn't find his remains. Right. Doesn't mean he's not dead. Right. You would have heard. I think you would have heard something if he was alive. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like I said, they distributed his picture to all the mental institutions in California. He would have gone by some somewhere if he is uh, unmedicated schizophrenic. With violent tendencies. Well, with the weather up there, that he wouldn't have survived unless he found some other trailer, you know, home or something to live in. Yeah, and then but, just like never came out. Like, right. come on, <laughs> he's, exactly. So I mean, he's he's he didn't come out alive. So right, he didn't. But they just wanted to out. find someone to blame, right? And, like people do, you know. Yeah. So yeah, that is the story of the Yuba County Five. It was a sad one. I mean, they're all sad, but yes. Uh, you go to a basketball game and you never come home. And you never come home. And yeah. You end up 70 miles in the wrong direction and. And dead. Dead. From hypothermia. Yeah. And one person or three people apparently find a cabin with food and heat and. But don't use it. Don't use it. And I think if anything, if they did split up when Jack Hewitt and Gary were the only ones left and they decided to leave, like, or maybe they didn't even leave together, but. You know, Gary hasn't been on his medication for three months. Maybe Jack is just like as as hard as it would have been for Jack to do it alone, because remember, he can't read or write or even dial a telephone. Maybe that would have been a scary situation for him. It's it's an unstable time when you uh, are not medicated and you need to be. Exactly. So, you know, who knows what happened with maybe Gary just took off. Maybe they left at the same time and split up. Maybe, uh, like, I don't know if I can see Jack Hewitt just like, I'm out of here kind of thing. Because he, he was the worst of the bunch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, he had I mean, the most difficulties. Who knows? They could have run in with a grizzly bear or something. You never know what. Um, I mean, they were in a forest. Yeah, in Northern California. <laughs> there exactly. are bears there. Okay. Sad story. It is. Now that we're done with that sadness. Time for some happiness. Time for some happiness. It's our segment called the decompression chamber. It's Sarah's turn. It is my turn. So this is where we go to feel a little bit better about life after these really sad tales like the Yuba County Five. I did not know what to talk about, but I was watching uh, – I was <laughs> – I was telling you this earlier. I was uh, very bored at work today because <laughs> it's like a bajillion degrees outside. So we had like four – 115. Right. <laughs> so we had like four customers all day. Uh, so it was uh, painfully slow for all of us. And I spent a lot of my time uh, like reading on my phone, on Kindle, <laughs> or uh, scrolling uh, TikTok. Mm. Or not TikTok, I'm sorry. Scrolling uh, Instagram or Facebook. <laughs> uh, 
don't tell my boss. Uh, but <laughs> she wasn't there today. She was off. But uh, it literally like just nothing to do. Um, I was not the only one just sitting on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I was on Instagram and I came across a post from uh, an account that I follow that is always wholesome. So I wanted to talk about them. I decided that would be a good thing to talk about. Is it the one you shared with me? I What did I share with you? You said so wholesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that one. <laughs> so uh, if you have never heard of Good Boy Ollie, and I think it's good.boy.ollie, uh, I highly recommend looking them up and giving them a follow because it always gives me something to smile about <laughs> because they're the best. So it started out with just Ollie, who is a chocolate lab, and he's like the chillest chocolate lab I've ever seen. So like... I don't know what you know about dogs, like how much you know about labs, but they are, first of all, insane. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's also, there's three different colors, like the, the three main colors, right? So you've got the yellow labs, which are the doofuses. Uh, you've got the black labs, which are kind of like... Psychos? No, they're, they're <laughs> just, uh, I mean, they're crazy, yes, but they're like, uh, maybe more like... They're not as much of a doofus as the yellow labs. <laughs> yellow labs, just every single one I've ever known is just a doofus. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's adorable and fun, but they're doofuses. Black labs, not as doofusy. <laughs> um, they like to eat everything. Like literally, whether it's edible or not, they just eat it. Uh, chocolate labs are the fucking psychos. I almost had my shoulder dislocated by two chocolate labs at one point when I worked at a doggy day camp. They are crazy, okay? But this chocolate lab, super chill. He is just like literally the goodest boy ever. <laughs> and it's so cute. Whenever he plays with a toy, they call it uh, nib dibs because <laughs> he just like kind of nibbles on the toy. It's so cute. <laughs> uh, but they're British, by the way. And uh, so there's like – they do videos of Ollie and they have like a um, – uh, what's that called when you have something like narrate it, but it's like a computer and it, so it has this like computerized, like British voice that like talks for Ollie. Mm -hmm. It's really cute. And so, so now I just imagine that like he talks like that, <laughs> um, but, uh, but he's just like the goodest boy ever. And he kind of went viral last year because he like fell in love with this pumpkin, <laughs> but then it like started to rot. So they had to like get rid of it, obviously. So they got him a stuffed pumpkin. <laughs> Uh, but this year they have uh, – they planted a pumpkin patch because he fell in love with his pumpkin last year. So they have a little pumpkin patch in their garden <laughs> that they planted. And they had did a little video of them, of the dogs, like, helping plant the garden. And they were, like, digging the holes to plant the seeds in. And then they'll, like uh, – Ollie will carry things in his mouth. So he would like carry out the little basket with the gardening tools in it <laughs> and like uses that they like hold his paw and like use his paw to like pat down the seeds and stuff is really cute. And then they painted a sign that's like Ollie's pumpkin patch. And then they like got their paws and like dip their paws in paint and like put little paw prints on the sign. It's just like <laughs> ridiculously adorable. So they have their own little pumpkin patch. And, uh, but this brings me to Ollie has a, a brother that I, I guess late last year, maybe, uh, they got Ollie a new brother and it's a yellow lab. So he's a doofus and they will tell you that himself. They, they're they always like, they'll show pictures of him with like his lips, like stuck up on his teeth and like, and it's always just like, you know, it's one of those like no thoughts, just vibes deals <laughs> with, with him. But uh, so they got this new puppy, this yellow lab. And I love telling people the story of how they came up with this dog's name, even though it's not even my story or my dog. And I do not know these people whatsoever, but I <laughs> love, love to tell this story to people who don't know about good boy Ollie. So they get this new puppy and they want to name him, obviously, but they don't know what to name him. So uh, every Saturday, Ollie gets, he has this little uh, like metal container and he gets to pick a piece of paper out of the container for an activity to do. It says activity jar. So what they did was uh, they wrote down some dog names that they were thinking about and they put them in his activity jar for him to pick. So what he'll, he'll, they'll put the jar down and he'll reach his nose in and he'll pick up one piece of paper and he'll just go bleh and like lem it out and spit the paper out. And then mom like reads it and that's the activity they do that weekend, you know? Mm -hmm. So they did this with the names. 
put the names in the activity jar. And he was just like, hmm. And they're like, come on, you you know what to do. You you reach in the jar, you pick out a piece of paper, and you're like, you know what to do. And he kind of like, he got up and he kind of started to walk towards his toys. And they're like, what what's he doing? And he goes and he picks up his potato toy and he brings it over. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's your potato toy. You love your potato. Okay. Uh, we're not naming the puppy potato, though. So just pick a name that's in the jar. <laughs> and then uh, finally he's laying there and he's he won't do it. He won't pick a name out of the jar. And he's just kind of laying there, and then he picks up his potato toy and he drops it into the into the activity jar <laughs> with the with the puppy names. So they're like, okay, fine. So they add some names to the bunch that are like potato themed. So there's like uh, there's Tato, Potato, um, but there were like five like potato themed names. Like I don't know, like Spud or something. I don't know, Tater Tot. I don't know, <laughs> but there were like five. Uh, themed names that had to do with potatoes and they put them in the jar shake up the jar put the jar down and they're like okay pick a name he picks out a name finally and it's tato <laughs> so they named the dog tato <laughs> <laughs> so this dog is named after a potato <laughs> and he like look i mean he acts like a dog named after a potato he's just <laughs> like they call him like the baby raptor and he's just acting like a psychotic yellow lab puppy Named Tato. Named Tato, yeah. <laughs> and all of these. It's just so it just always makes me smile. Cause they go and they do these little activities and they're uh like Ollie's still good boy Ollie, and then he's got little baby brother Tato who's like because they'll be like, Ollie does nib nibs and it shows him like just nibbling gently on his toys, and then they're like, you know, the baby raptor, and then he's just like rah, 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 and just like <laughs> destroying things and <laughs> it's just funny and they're like ollie does wormy worms and he'll like after he gets wet he'll like you know rub his back against the grass or whatever and then tato's just like flopping wildly or whatever it's just like <laughs> it's just funny that like, they like show the differences between the two of them but they're still like best buds Aww. and they'll like cuddle up and sleep together and stuff so oh, i sent you that one today where it's like you know about him being a big brother and he's like his his friend to rest his head on and he can nib nib his brother now. He can nib nib his brother, not just his toys. Yeah, it's just like the most wholesome account on Instagram. So if you ever just need to smile about something, you can go to Good Boy Ollie and and you will it will happen. <laughs> it's just like the best. I love it. <laughs> I also am obsessed with dogs, so there's that. But um but it's really great if you're ever just feeling down and need something so yeah that was my decompression chamber story so cute i feel so much better right and that's just me explaining it not even you watching it uh so yeah if you guys want to submit your own stories for the decompression chamber we would love that Rhonda, how do they do go about doing that go ahead and send that to us at macabre storytime at gmail.com and put um, decompression chamber in the um, subject line and let us know if you want us to mention your name and yes. where the story. Yeah. And if we'll, we can give you a shout out on the, on the pod, on the podcast. Yeah. And uh, I would really love to have people actually send us some stories to do. I think that'd be really fun. Mm -hmm. I agree. See what you guys want to listen to besides us just telling you about our dogs and, and your children. child. <laughs> <laughs> I would say our children, but I just have the dogs well, and Frank, you have my child. That right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Macabre Storytime. To stay in the know on all things macabre, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Macabre Storytime, or you can email us at that same email address, macabre storytime at gmail.com. And once again, if you are interested in supporting the show, head on over to our new Patreon page at patreon.com slash macabre storytime. There are three tiers to choose from if you want to um, support the show. For a dollar a month, you can be a death water drinker. Yum. Delish. For three dollars a month, you can be a mind bobbler. <laughs> <laughs> and for five dollars a month, you can join us in the Terrible People Club. It's a great place to be. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not hot there. It is not hot. It is very cold. It's, it's chill. Very it's, it's like it's jacket weather it's yeah. hoodie weather hoodie weather it's perfect yeah lots of uh i like hoodie weather hoodie and legging weather yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's got uh like uh muffins and oh. baked goods i like muffins coffee che cheese danishes yeah cheese danishes some coffee Ooh, coffee so it's kind of like a starbucks but minus the corporate 
bullshit. Because <laughs> it's always freezing in Starbucks. They have muffins and cheese danishes and coffee. Ice coffee. That too. That is coffee. <laughs> I know. Uh, anyways. <laughs> Back to this. Um, <laughs> as a Patreon supporter, of course, you will have exclusive access to bonus episodes, behind the scenes content, some stickers. We're working on those. We've already gotten the first piece of artwork back for stickers. So mm -hmm. hopefully those will be in the works shortly. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, you can live stream with us, talk about our episodes and ask questions and all kinds of stuff. Also, don't forget, check out uh, Malice of Forethought. It is also available wherever you get your podcasts. That's our sister pod. And of course, thank you so much for listening tonight. And until next time. Uh, if you have a big game, don't don't go to the basketball yeah. game. Just you know what? Stay just, at home. just don't go into the wilderness. Yeah. Nothing good happens out there. No. I'm not stay an in out the car. I mean, I know I'm not an outdoorsy person, so this is coming from my perspective, but if you have to go to the game and you get lost, just stay in the car. Just yeah, don't leave the car. Stay in the car. Wait till daylight. Somebody'll find you. Uh, yeah. Or 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 go back the way you came. Or like I said, just don't go into the wilderness <laughs> at all whatsoever. <laughs> stay home. Work from home. Uh, use shipped and Instacart to get your groceries. You got DoorDash and Uber Eats and all kinds of places that deliver food. You literally never have to leave your house. And I think that's probably uh, more preferable to uh, anything. PSA from Sarah. Never leave your house. <laughs> never leave your house. <laughs> Nothing bad can happen there. <laughs> that's going to be on a t-shirt. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> until next time. Bye, guys. Thanks Bye. for listening. <laughs>